recognizing how you feel about the things you were able to get done uh, in the last year and a half? Well, I, you know, coming into uh, the trade deadline, uh, you know, first off, we're in a race to make the playoffs. So, you know, try to add some, some offense um, down the stretch. And obviously, in Athens, is a player that I know very well from Detroit, had 30 goals a year ago. Um, you know, give up two second-round draft picks, and obviously it's more than a rental. He's a restricted free agent for a couple of years. Uh, and then... It, and then with about an hour to go, acquired uh, Tyler Ennis for a uh, for a fifth round draft pick, and obviously a guy that's a uh, player that's been around the National Hockey League and having a good season, 14 goals. So both shoot left. Uh, we have lots of right right wingers, so uh, gets us a little bit deeper, gives the coaches some some options on their line combinations, and obviously the uncertainty. You know, we we've been talking about James Neal, you know. Still, two to three weeks away. Obviously, it's going to take some while here for Nygaard with his hand to get going. So uh, they give us some insurance as we head down the stretch in our pursuit of a playoff spot. What's your feeling on Athanasiu? It seems like he's a bit of a lightning rod. When he's on, he's great, and when yeah. he's not on, is that like most young players, or is that something that it, that it, uh, it, that might be? You know, he's a talented player, uh, and I think uh, you know again he. He's having a tough year. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, he's a talented player. and We're hoping uh, that with, uh, you know, what we've got here in Edmonton, the coaching staff, that we can get the best out of him. Do you see with Green a guy that can, uh, he's a power play guy everywhere else he's been. Do you see him running your power play? And does giving Clefbaum a few less minutes a night perhaps make him a better player? First off, Mark, I'm not the coach. So my job is to bring in players. And then it's up to the coaching staff to decide how they're going to be used. So, you know, I think that's a question you, you should ask tomorrow, for Coach Tippett. Um, you know, my job, I think, coming into the deadline is to bring in, uh, you know, are you a buyer, are you a seller, or do you feel you should stand pat? And as we went into this, we felt that um, we'd like to do something to uh, put a little... Um, I'm going to use the word buzz into our team. Obviously, we're, we're, they've, they've played hard all year. Um, they've battled and scratched and clawed. We've got ourselves in a position where we're fighting for a playoff spot. Um, we're banged up a little bit, and um, I wanted to, you know, provide some depth. Certainly, you know, we used a fifth-round pick to uh, to acquire Ennis. It's a fourth-round pick that goes to a third if we're in the final four for Green. Obviously, we give up two second-round draft picks for uh, for Athens CU. So, paid a big price, uh, relatively big price for for Athens CU. Um, but again, it's not a rental. It's it's uh, he's a restricted free agent. And in terms of how they're going to be used, who they're playing with, what are the line combinations, who's running the power play, that's up for the coaching staff to decide going forward. Did you feel you needed to give your coaching staff a faster set of forwards? Did you need to increase your speed up there? Uh, I think you want to have a fast team. You know, I think we've got some players on the team that can play fast. Uh, you know, I use the word dimensions. You know, you need lots of dimensions. You need size. You need some big guys. You need some defensive forwards. You need some offensive player forwards. You need some some playmakers. And certainly Ennis and Athens CU Green, they're all guys that can skate. Uh, I like a team that can skate. I like a team that can compete. So, uh, but uh, not everybody has to skate fast. Nah, no, I th not, you know, I went into this thinking that we needed to get more up front. Obviously, um, you know, we, you know, again, I'm going to come back to the Neal injury. I'm going to come back to the Nygaard injury. Um, you know, those two in particular are going to be a while here. Um, they both shoot left. Uh, they both play left wing for the most part. And we're in a pursuit of trying to get into the playoffs. Um, and, um, you know, Mathis Cedar shoots left, plays left wing. Ennis shoots left, plays left wing. They can, they, they can go over to the other side. Obviously, it was a difficult um, meeting with Sam Gagne, who, um, you know, I know loves being an oiler. And certainly as we worked our way through the cap, we had to... Um, 
in effect moves move Sam's contract to uh, make room to to add a contract so you know on, on one hand it's uh, you know I'm excited about the, what we were able to accomplish but it was tough to uh, tip and I met with Sam and told him the news and it's uh, those are never easy decisions because uh, you're, you're talking you, these are these are people and and uh, they've got you know lives and emotions and it was uh, on the other hand it was a tough day you moved anybody onto LTIR to make cap space? Uh, Chris Russell last night, and we today we assigned uh, uh, Tyler Benson back to Bakersfield. And does that mean that you're uh, on the hook for any bonuses next year? Will those get pushed into next year's cap? Uh, possibly depends what goes on the next four or five weeks. Um, the Russell situation you say was murky. Is that one of those ones? Chris where, Russell? Yes, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure where he's at. Um, I have to ask you, on his good nights, what do we get, what are the fans in Edmonton expecting from him? Uh, well, obviously he's got, he's got great speed. Uh, he's got, um, you know, obviously got high-end skill. Um, and he's a talented player. And he's, you know, I think he's 25 years of age. So we're hoping that, you know, he's not 21 and 22. He's 25 years of age, and we're hoping that uh, his best years are ahead of him. And then you get him. He, has, he plays well, and you can get him, get him signed to a longer-term contract, obviously, because he's. Well, I don't think that far out. I mean, okay. what I'm what I'm thinking of is I traded two second-round draft picks. We got a talented young player. We own his rights for two more years after this year. Uh, I'll worry about the contract in the summertime as I get to uh, continue to watch, but certainly we can we can uh, put in a qualifying offer and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll head down that path. So, so uh, you mentioned about looking ahead the draft. You know, you, you have a first rounder and possibly not another pick till the fifth round. Yeah. So are you probably looking okay somehow in the summer? I got to get some of those picks back somehow. Yeah. 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 How important was it for you, Ken, that you? I, mean, I think I think at the end of the day, Jim. I think at the end of the day, my message today is we're trying to win. I've come to Edmonton. I've come to Edmonton, and we've got a great nucleus, um, and they've played hard. They've played hard to put ourselves in this position where we compete for a playoff spot. And you know, the last three years I was a seller in Detroit, and we made the playoffs for 25 years before. It's fun to be in the playoffs. And it's fun to, for the fans, for the players, to have an opportunity to go against the team head-to-head -head for two weeks. And then if you're able to win that, to move on to the next round and be in the final eight and be in the final four. And I get back to, again, it's a fifth-round pick and it's a fourth-round pick. Certainly we paid a price for Athens CU. And no risk, no gain. No risk, no gain. I can sit around and do nothing, and I can puddle around. And at the end of the day, the, the coaching staff have worked incredibly hard, incredibly hard, on a day-to-day -day basis starting at day one of training camp or going back to the summertime. And I think that our players have worked extremely hard, bought into everything the coaching staff has asked of them. And I'm, I, I like that our team comes to work every day. They compete. Um, we're playing good defense. We're finding different ways to win. We have different people stepping up. We lost Connor for a period of time. We went to six games. We go three, two, and one. So I think I felt like I had an obligation to try to pitch in and, and help out. And we're trying to build a program. And if you can make the playoffs, and certainly we're in a real race. We're in a real race. This, there's no guarantee we're going to be in the playoffs. So that's why in the Athens CU, if you don't make the playoffs, we still have Athens CU. Uh, it wasn't done just, just for this year. And I just think that it was, it, was, it was my time to try to pitch in to a group of people that have worked extremely hard to put ourselves in a position. And do you feel more comfortable? You acquired two guys from Detroit. Did you go into the draft saying, OK, I don't know these players as well as guys I've dealt with before. Did that have any bearing uh, on how you looked at them compared to other players? Well, I mean, obviously I know that, that you know, first off, I would say to you, um, I had a group of pro scouts. And, and, then, and then, you know, over the course of the last two weeks, 
leading up to whatever decisions we did make or didn't make over the last 24 hours. You know, then I would talk to, um, you know, video co uh, Coupal, and I would talk to, to Tippett, and I would talk to Jim Playfair, and we would look at uh, all these players, and they looked at video, and in talking to my coaches and talking to my pro scouts, we eventually worked our way to a decision. So certainly, uh, it's not me just stepping up and telling all these guys I'm going to start to pick Detroit players. Uh, the people that are on the staff have had uh, significant input into the decision-making process. And not giving up a first rounder, that was always a no-go. Yes. For a rental, for any of <clears throat> Uh, I don't. I mean, I, I, I don't know about that. I, you know, nothing. Nothing was really, you know, to trade the first round pick. There was. There was never any conversations, and no player was ever offered to me. Nobody ever asked uh, about that. Obviously, a very busy deadline for you. Did you come close to getting a center, or did you? Did you try for that? Was that on your your target? Uh, I did not know. Good. Thank okay. you. Uh, Thanks, guys. So
Welcome to continued live coverage of the NHL's trading deadline on Oilers TV and EdmontonOilers.com. I'm Tony Brar, pleased to be joined by Jack Michaels and Bob Stauffer. And gentlemen, uh, we just talked to GM and President of Hockey Operations, Ken Holland. He said, no risk, no gain. Gives up four total draft picks in the past 16 hours, but he's made it clear to this club that this team is vying for a playoff spot, Jack. Well, I think when you look at what he's given up, he's given up two second round picks, and if you take a look at, for instance, the 2014 draft where Braden Point is the highlight, only six regulars out of that second round, you know, so it's it's one out of every five. Uh, and then a couple of mid-round picks, and what he's added is for sure a top six forward, uh, for sure a top nine who can kind of play up and down the lineup in Tyler Ennis. Uh, Andreas Athanasiu is a guy who I think might start on a line with Connor McDavid, but might actually end up being as good or better fit with Leon Dreisaitl. And then depth, not only on the blue line, but playoff experience, playing with elite players on the power play and yep. quarterbacking a power play in Mike Green. So I think at the end of this last, what is it, 14 hours, Edmonton is a much better team than they were than the, the club that beat L.A. And the club that beat L.A. is 13-5-3 in their last 21. So mission accomplished if you're Ken Holland. Bob, all very intriguing names. Sorry to cut you off there, but is Andreas Anthony to you the most intriguing name of the three because he is an RFA at the end of the year? Well, I think Jack hit on something when he did the record, the 13-5-3 record. I mean, Ken Holland said basically six weeks ago the team will decide the course of action. Well, the team went on a pretty good run here, and Ken talked about pitching in, and he used that phrase, pitching in, multiple times. Athanasio, to me, is a bit of a wild card, and the wild card is this. He's going to contribute something. It's just going to be a question of how much. When the Edmonton Oilers, when we were flying off a couple of years ago uh, into Philadelphia at uh, the trade deadline, uh, we didn't know how much impact Patrick Maroon would have. Well, bing, the Oilers got Patrick Maroon. He became a 27-goal scorer the next year. You know, Alex Chason scored 22 goals last year as a, a guy in on a PTO because they got a chance to play with Connor McDavid. And therein lies a bit of the rub with, with, you know, what happens here with Athanasio is regardless if it's with McDavid or Dreisaitl, the reality is he's going to be able to contribute. And the other thing is in Detroit, it was Larkin, it was Athanasio, you know, those were two of the drivers uh, for the team along with Anthony Mantha, but there was a lot of pressure. I don't think he's going to have the same pressure, Tony, on a game-by-game -game basis because he doesn't have to be the driver given the strength the Oilers have down the middle. And even I'll throw Ryan Nugent Hopkins in the mix here too. So I think he's in, poised to be in a position to succeed. As Jack uh, mentioned uh, in a conversation we had before, I mean, he didn't score in his first nine breakaways this year. Got off to a tough start. There's a player there. Uh, the Oilers certainly increased their team speed. And then Ennis just knows how to play. Yeah. He's just a smart guy that could go out there and make plays and create offense. The depth, the, the Oilers were number one in the league on the power play, number two in PK. Edmonton's got way more depth now up front, five on five. And I'm with Jack in defense. You never go wrong at a veteran team. Jack, how important was it for Ken Holland? He mentioned it that both Anthony Siu and Ennis can play both sides, especially with the injury bug that's hit the Oilers in the last month. Well, Kyler Yamamoto was shaken up in the LA game. We don't know what his status is, but for instance, if Yamamoto was to have to sit out a game or two, boom, you can play Ennis on the right side yeah. with Drysaddle and Nugent Hopkins. If there is some ineffectiveness or injury on the top line, you can run Tyler Ennis all the way up, and he's smart enough, as Bob mentioned, a heady player that can play either side with Connor McDavid and not slow him down. He's also a guy that, if everyone's healthy, could fit in very nicely on a line with Riley Shan and Josh Archibald. Yeah. Or he's a guy who you could theoretically throw on the fourth line for a little offensive juice, maybe with Gaetan Haas and or Chase Honor Cassian, depending on who's playing well in the top six. So when you add the versatility, that's what's great about Ennis. And Athens CU, just one more point on him, and I think it goes for Mike Green as well. When you get off to a tough start and your team is one that's been outscored by 110 goals, especially for a winger, Plus minus is not something to get caught up in a great deal. You're one of the best players on a horrific team. So your numbers are not going to look that great. This is a chance for him to re-energize himself and play with two of the best players in the world. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't take hold of that.
Tony, the level of excitement right now for the Oilers fan base, and you know, I, I did four hours today on the air on Oilers now, and you know, just took a look at the text, and the fans are elated because they know hockey, and they know the Edmonton Oilers didn't have, give up Bouchard, they didn't give up Broberg, they didn't give up the number one, and they're not dumb. They know that Yessa Pugliarvi, who's currently second right now in uh, Liga scoring over in Finland, the Oilers are going to be able to basically probably get roughly the same asset value back that they put out in the deal to get off in a seal. They're going to be able to replicate something similar. Maybe it's a second or third, maybe it's a prospect or second. So, uh, you know, and the only part that's tough today is the fact that Sam Gagne, who's been a, a real good, uh, you know, Edmonton Oiler over the years and a guy who loves playing in Edmonton, that's, that's the only downer for all of this. And uh, He's set a standard for professionalism, right. and that's where Green helps that. Right. And, right? and so, and, you know, but at the end of the day, the players, you know, they're going to be, when you go to interview them tomorrow, they're going to be jacked. They're going to be stoked because the GM went out and proved the team. And from a long-term vision in terms of building a program, which Ken Holland has, you know, reinforced on multiple occasions here over the last three months, Edmonton didn't give up a lot of substantial assets to do so. And I thought that last point that Bob made is the yeah, most exactly. telling about this. Exactly. Is Ken Holland kind of put himself in the room with the players at the very end there. He said, look, They've worked hard over the last six or seven weeks to put themselves in the position. I can sit around and do nothing, or I can give them a few tools and, and hopefully pitch in enough to help them get over the finish line. And I, I thought that was real impressive, and Bob and I have seen this before. Seven years ago, there was an opportunity for the Oilers to make the postseason in the shortened schedule. With 12 games to go, Edmonton was sitting in the eighth spot, and at that particular point in time, they didn't pull the trigger on maybe an asset or two that might have improved the hockey club. Yeah. And I think it had to some degree a deflationary cast was over the team. Yeah. This is the direct opposite of that. The GM has said it. The players look at the players that were acquired. And these are headline type of players. All three of these guys at one team were one of the five best players on their respective hockey clubs. Tyler Anderson, I mean, he, these are good players yeah. that Ken Holland got. Yeah. So that's why Bob is feeling the excitement. It's incredible and a little unusual with how tight the Pacific Division really is this year. So, Bob, it's really a question of why not us this year, right? Well, I, th I certainly think, and I remember back to that 2012-2003 lockout year, 13 lockout year, and the loan acquisition was Jared Smith. Yeah. And there might have been opportunities yeah. to give up another second-round pick to, to get in a pretty good goaltender in Ben Bishop. And that didn't, ironically, with Ottawa, a team the Oilers made a deal with today. Uh, yeah, the Pacific's there to be open. I mean, there's no question I think Vegas improved their team. They got Martinez and they got Laner. That's going to improve their hockey club. Uh, but they don't have McDavid and Dry Settle, yeah. right? So, uh, and they have a hole down the middle now. And Edmonton's got. That's, I can't reiterate this point more. The team's number one in the league in the power play, number two in PK. The only question for all the naysayers of the Oilers, well, their five on five play. Well, guess what? They just improved the five on five options that the coach has at his disposal. And a couple of other team notes for today. The general manager Ken Holland did mention that they did move defenseman Chris Russell onto long term injured reserve, and also sent down. Tyler Benson down to the Bakersfield Condors of the AHL. Jack and Bob will have the call for the new look Oilers on Tuesday night <laughs> at the Honda Center from Anaheim. As always, we'll have you covered right here on Oilers TV and EdmontonOilers.com.